On December 1, 1958, the Our Ladies of Angels Catholic School in Chicago burned. When the fire broke out, there were roughly 1,600 students in the school. As a result of the fire, 94 children and three nuns would perish, resulting in the deadliest school disaster in the history of Chicago and one of the deadliest fires in U.S. history. Fire inspectors would later conclude that the origin of the fire began in the basement of the older North Wing. The specific ignition source was not determined, but they believed its origin was a cardboard trash barrel. However, later in 1962, a boy would confess to starting the fire. The fire was within feet of an open chase pipe which allowed superheated gases and smoke to rise to the second floor. The fire smoldered undetected for roughly 20 minutes, allowing sufficient time for smoke, heat, fire, and toxic gases to gather and fill the building stairway, blocking the primary means of egress from the second floor, catching the second story building occupants off guard. The north wing of the school was a two-story structure built in 1910 that had been remodeled multiple times. Additional structures were built next to it in 1951, an annex was added that connected the multiple structures giving its U-shaped appearance today. The building had an exterior brick facade keeping with building codes implemented from the Great Chicago Fire. However, the interior was constructed from primarily combustible wooden material. In addition, the hardwood floors had been coated multiple times with highly flammable wax and varnishes, and the ceiling was made out of cellulose tiles. The building had a basement that extended partially above ground, with 12-foot ceilings on the first and second floors. This meant windows on the second floor were nearly 25 feet from the ground, directly complicating evacuation of 329 children and five nuns during the fire. At the time of the fire, the building itself had only one fire escape, which would be blocked by fire smoke and hot gases. The school had a total of two unmarked fire alarm switches, both located in the south wing. The four fire extinguishers in the north wing were mounted over seven feet high on the walls, making it difficult, if not impossible, for the children or nuns to access. It had no heat detectors, and it lacked a direct connection to the fire department. And, there also were no fire-resistant stairwells, no fire doors, no automatic smoke or fire alarms, nor fire sprinkler systems. The nearest fire alarm box was more than a block and a half away. Engine 85 was dispatched to 3808 West Iowa Street in regards to a working, fully involved structure fire. The communications between the dispatchers and the woman had difficulty in understanding what was going on, but eventually the address came out to the incoming units. Nearly seconds after, another lady called from the restroom at the school, stating the school was in flames and children were stuck on the second floor. Once the fire alarm was set off, it immediately notified Box 5182, Chief Miles Devine, 18th Battalion. Two minutes after the alarm was received, Engine 85 requested all available ambulances to respond to the fire. Incoming units were told many kids had jumped from the second story window. It was now a total of 10 medical ambulances and an additional 70 police officers with stretcher bearing vehicles responding to the fire on Iowa Street. Engine 85, the first company to arrive, split into two sections, one with a two and a half inch line and the other group raising every ladder they had on their engine. Within seconds, truck 35 arrived and they also raised their ladders, including catching children with life nets. Minutes after, squad six arrived they were permitted to take over the life net to free men up to start from truck 35, opening the roof and raise more ladders. The officer in charge of engine 85 had no difficulty in finding the location and where the fire started, which was located in the rear stairwell at the northeast corner of the U-constructed school. He realized the fire had an extreme start and already reached the second floor of the school. While the men of engine 85 assigned to life-saving were helping with ladders and life nets. Water was being poured into the burning stairwell in hopes of cutting the volume of fire. It was at this very moment that the firefighters knew that it would be impossible to save the lives of every student. Over the span of two, over the span of two to three minutes, more units have showed up. The first engine on the box responded, laid a two and a half inch line equipped with a standard operating fog nozzle. They then entered the front stairwell of the building in hopes of cutting the fire off and pushing it into the stairwell to enable the trapped children in the top of the stairs to escape be behind the fog spray. Truckies were swinging axes as fast as they could to get the roof open to ventilate the school. 
Minutes later, the roof proceeded to collapse, and it was now known the students were trapped and lost in the event. With roof collapsing, a blast of superheated air and gas in the building, which snuffed out every ounce of life from those still caught in the building. It also knocked down two firefighters that were in the stairwell trying to make it to the second floor. Two firefighters were sent to the hospital in this catastrophic event. Water is being thrown into the building by hand lines, high pressure wagons, and a new water tower was able to push the fire out the roof and make it possible for personnel to get into the classroom, classrooms on the north side of the building. The fire was so dense, thick, and hot, the firefighters were forced to back out. But as first responders, they kept trying. Chief Daly then ordered for an additional two trucks and two squads to be sent to the scene to aid fire equipment already there. After the fire was put to rest, the big question was why the dispatch to firefighters were delayed 20 minutes. This resulted in 93 persons dead. I believe the things that could have been different and changed the outcome and also would have changed this delayed response uh, to include providing cor uh, correct location of fire. <clears throat> this causes a delay in responders also, which then doesn't give them enough time to work and help those in need. If things could have been different, I believe the school could have been equipped with a few safety functions. This is to include installing fire detectors with alarms, making all stairs fireproof, provide more exits that are accessible, and installing automatic sprinklers and providing the exterior with more fire escapes. This would ensure people would have to leap, or wouldn't have to leap once making it to the roof or a window with the exits available. The sprinklers could have stopped the fire or at least kept it in one section even slowed down the progress, the progression of fire. If the stairs were made from wood and even the material near it wouldn't give the fire so much momentum. The first step in any response is somehow contacting the closest fire department. Whether that's a phone call or the fire alarm being triggered manually or automatically depends on the situation. In this case, the alarm that was pulled by a teacher was not connected directly to a fire department. The nearest department was alerted by a call from the school's housekeeper who was informed of the situation by the janitor. Unfortunately, there was an unexplained 12-minute delay in the call. Rescue operations started with the school staff attempting to evacuate students until the fire department arrived on the scene. These rescue attempts were further delayed, wasting precious time when the fire department received incorrect information on the location of the fire. When finally on the scene, the fire was upgraded to five alarm, which calls for all available equipment and units. To add to the already overdue rescue operations, the gate allowing access to the back of the building was locked and had to be rammed by a fire truck to be successfully opened. At this point, children were jumping from the second story windows to escape the flames that were quickly becoming unbearable. Firefighters worked in tandem with the school staff to remove students and teachers from as many classrooms as possible. A new snorkel unit was used to lower the temperature of one of the rooms by forcing large amounts of water into it, allowing the occupants that had not already succumbed to the toxic gases to be rescued. All in all, over 160 children were rescued from the fire. More than 200 firefighters from 22 engine companies, 7 ladder companies, and 10 squad companies responded to the Our Lady of Angels School of Fire. A combination of late detection and fire-friendly atmosphere within the school will drastically reduce the options that were available for rescue. Taking a look back, the school had an alarm system that was lacking and inefficient. There were no sprinklers or fire detectors, and only one emergency exit was provided. Internally, the school was furnished with highly combustible materials which aided in the rapid spread of the fire and devastating temperatures being reached extremely quickly. As seen in many other fires, the occupancy limit was exceeded as the capacity requirements for the exit were not met. Shortly after the fire, the National Fire Protection Association put their provisions for schools under the microscope and ended up completely overhauling them. Exit standards were changed and the requirement for schools to install sprinklers was established. Since these changes were implemented, there have been no school fires with more than 10 deaths, which proves the modifications to not only be effective, but life-saving. Um, the NMPA, the National Fire Protection Association, they, they did an investigation, and I'm going to quote what they said, uh, it need not have happened. And my part that I was researching was on mistakes made and codes violated. 
and um, there were many in this particular school fire. Um, just to sum it up and you know quickly address these points. Uh, one, this school did not have a fire sprinkler system. This would have actually prevented the fire from growth at its incipient stage, meaning when the fire is just starting out, it would have, could have easily put it out. Um, the school was also a two-story school with long corridors that were in a U-shaped fashion, um, and they did not have appropriate smoke vents, um, which would have alleviated some of the smoke and the toxic fumes that killed many of the students before they probably even burned. Um, also, um, the, they did not have adequate enclosure of stairways. Uh, and it would have been fairly inexpensive to actually properly enclose the stairways. Um, they also did not have uh, more than one way out. Uh, egress is very important inside of public facilities. Uh, when you have many students or uh, a facility that has a lot of faculty, you have to have ways to have uh, a, a good means of egress. A way out is what that means. And so basically it would give people quick access to get out and uh, without even being harmed. Uh, another thing that I researched that was particularly interesting about this, and this is uh, the same in other fires as well, is that there's what's called a grandfather's cause. And that means that this particular building was a pre-vintage uh, building and it was adjoined with another building. Um, it was a church before it became a, a, a school. And basically this made the school exempt from uh, vents, fire sprinkler systems, and certain uh, fire prevention measures that would have actually prevented a uh, certain death for these, these students and teachers. So I, I want to encourage you to research the Our Ladies of Angels school fire, uh, do a little bit of reading, and you will see that these events could have easily been prevented. Uh, and that's according to NFPA, which is a very popular... Not only in Chicago, but throughout the country. The experts determined that the school was governed by the 1905 city ordinance and not the 1949 Chicago Municipal Code. Thus, the facility was legally safe, even though it did not measure up to any contemporary fire safety standards. The Blue Ribbon Jury announced 20 non-binding recommendations for improving fire safety in schools. On January 7th, 1959, the jury announced more than 20 non-binding recommendations for improving fire safety in schools. The recommendations included the installation of automatic sprinklers, smoke and heat detectors, the enclosure of all stairwells and other vertical passages, and the installation of fire barrier doors at all corridors and the jury also advocated that all schools install new fire alarm systems that would alert both school occupants and the fire department, as well as the installation of fire department alarm boxes within 100 feet of the entrances to public and private schools. School fire safety also emerged as a civil priority elsewhere in the United States in the aftermath of the fire. In New York City, the fire commissioner ordered the immediate inspection of the city's more than 1,500 school buildings. 18 schools in New York City were closed within days of the uh, Chicago fire because of um, safety violations. In 1959, the Los Angeles Department was motivated by the school Chicago fire to conduct a series of test investigation fires in school buildings with open stairwells. However, despite the national attention to school fire safety, fire safety in contemporary schools is far from ideal. Five decades later, there are no federal life safety codes and standards governing U.S. schools. Codes and standards for schools and other buildings are enacted only at the state and local government levels with no national requirements for adherence or uniformity. Even though there have been many improvements in school fire safety, there's still much to be done to ensure that all students get home safely every day from school.